While World War Z is a zombie book, it's hard to see it as a horror novel. The subject is nightmarish, and the situations are often terrifying for the people involved. But while its stories are personal, they don't focus on putting you in the midst of the terror. As I said previously, there are no tales of people who had to survive in any of the blue zones, facing the constant assault against their defenses and the horrific things sometimes necessary to survive. The tale of the road to nowhere probably best illustrates the viewpoint of the novel, the event of all those people fleeing in terror, finding themselves trapped, is told from the point of view of someone with a distant view, his hovering blimp separated from the event as much as from the real threat. While other zombie works, especially films, are meant to terrify you by bringing you face to face with the threat, World War Z is less concerned about scaring you and more about connecting you to its characters in the events. The living dead are far more like a catastrophic event than the stuff of horror movies, like an asteroid strike or a nuclear exchange. This means that the perspective is that they are a problem that needs resolution. The retaking of the U.S. is described in great detail. After the Battle of Hope, the plan was to sweep the country clean, a march east to cover every square inch to ensure that no zombies were missed. Canada and Mexico agreed to clear out their borders to ensure that none would re-enter the U.S., with the understanding that after America was clear, they would get assistance in clearing their own countries. The U.S. military split into three groups, North, Middle, and South, driving across the country and exterminating zombies, facing down those other threats that I went over last time, and moving to meet up for a push into New York City for the end of the campaign. But other places handled things their own way to show their national viewpoints. While the U.S. worked on creating a military with technology specifically made to combat the threat that they faced, Russia relied on its Cold War stockpile of weapons. The results were far more sloppy and led to more of the soldiers being infected. Well, the development of the country into a religious state came from the need to deal with that. You couldn't order other soldiers to do it, not after the decimation. And ordering the officers to do that just drove them to commit suicide. Finally, the only way that seemed to be there to deal with it was to tell the infected to shoot themselves. Well, this didn't sit well with one of the priests, since suicide is a sin, so he finally interrupted this by doing the deed himself, setting in motion a resurgence of faith after a century of communism and materialism failed to fill the void for the nation. Britain had to deal with the frequent fog that obscured visibility, so when it went back into action it worked slowly and carefully, spending five years just on London. France, on the other hand, moved much more rapidly, in the wake of their past century, which led to loss of territory or conquest, and then to be overrun by zombies. They needed that self-confidence again that the U.S. president had talked about. They needed heroes. That's why they pushed hard, fought hard, and lost many, especially in the catacombs beneath Paris, where their forces were ill-equipped to fight in the environment that they found themselves in with flooding, flammable gas, collapsing tunnels and gaping holes, and of course, filled with those who had tried to flee the plague of zombies only to succumb to them in the end. They fought as much to purge the reputation of the French as cowards as to kill the zombies, reclaiming their national pride as they reclaimed their nation. Even the ocean wasn't free from combat, and it was a most necessary one. Zombies were somehow not being destroyed by either salt water or pressure, and would wander about causing mayhem with things like harbors and offshore oil rigs, and attacking forces that were making amphibious landings. Special mesh suits and diving rigs were required to fight them in these most unexpected places. But that is a world-changing threat. There's going to be too many down there to write off, but with water covering 71% of the Earth's surface with an environment that requires specialized technology just to reach, there's no conceivable way to simply sweep it clean. It took years and years just to clear the majority of the habitable surface with entire armies working to do the job. The ocean floor, I mean, we're talking three times all that territory combined. The former White House Chief of Staff had compared the zombie outbreak to crime and poverty, problems that can never possibly be solved, just managed. It was a sign of his lack of proper priorities, more concerned with preserving political power than doing the right and necessary thing. Now, thanks to that attitude and others who shared it, it has to be managed. It's such a large area in such an inaccessible place that all you can do is try to be on guard for them when you're doing deep sea work or when they're coming up out of the surf. 
This means that even though the war is won, zombies are still out there, something that we have to keep in mind. New communities are built to be completely zombie-proof and with less jackassery than that reality show model on Long Island. Children are raised knowing not to go near still water, to go out alone or at night. Our goal was to prove to ourselves and future generations that we remain the dominant spirit on Earth. And we did. Dominant, but not uncontested. The population has suffered a significant loss, so much so that Russia has a breeding program for repopulation. The environment has undergone significant damage from the burning of Saudi oil and the nuclear exchanges, pointless acts of destruction. But there was also the destruction that came from bitter necessity, the deforestation to keep warm in the bitter winter months, the starving masses that were fleeing zombies that ate everything that, ironically, were now eating everything themselves just to survive. Species were eaten to extinction by both humans and zombies. One of the final messages is from the woman who had not paid any attention to the warnings besides getting on phalanx, taking blame on herself and the rest of her generation for allowing this to happen. The reason jackasses like that chief of, st of staff could do what they did was because we hold them accountable for things we don't like, raising taxes for things we don't want, going to war for reasons we don't agree with. But long-term issues are less often on our minds. We're just trying to get through the day. And the consequence is that government is disinclined to think long-term. And now, there are long-term transformations to the world and to our way of life. Things cannot go back to the way they were. Not shouldn't, but literally can't. The world has been changed beyond our ability to fully restore it. We can only adapt to the new world. The flip side of the independent spirit is that one must take full responsibility. This scarred world is now our fault. Max Brooks had previously made waves with the zombie survival guide, a sometimes tongue-in-cheek look at the zombie menace. He has a bit of fun with that book, actually, in World War Z, with Todd contemptuously muttering about survival guides before making a jerking-off gesture. And the translator for Radio Free Earth critical of the civilian survival guide. It's especially amusing in the audiobook version because this is followed up by Brooks, who's the narrator, saying, Oh, really? A bit defensively. The two books are distinct since the guide is filled with anecdotes about the living dead throughout history, which is incompatible with the backstory of the novel, though the same virus is likely in play in both works. But while the guide exists to help you survive the crisis, World War Z shows you how it all breaks down and pointedly tells you why it happens, why things will be so out of hand that you probably won't. The reason it all falls apart is that, ultimately, we refuse to take action until a catastrophe passed the tipping point. All warnings were disregarded by the public while the government's ability to respond to catastrophe was revealed to be impotent. In one sense, it's a reminder of the then-recent Katrina, a message that we were a clean-it-up-later society rather than one that is proactive in disaster preparedness. But the novel also draws comparisons to the greatest generation. It praises their ability to weather the Great Depression, win World War II, and then return to build a strong middle class. But what should also be noted is that it wasn't until bombs were falling on American soil that the nation went into that war. Much like in World War Z, with people recovering from the wars in the Middle East leading to weariness, people recovering from the Depression weren't chomping at the bit to go to war until the war arrived here. And like with World War Z, the United States underwent a radical change to meet the demands of this challenge. That's likely why the greatest generation received such praise in the book, since they proved that the country was capable of achieving incredible things if they could just get up off their butts and decide to do it. And that's not limited to the U.S., although the largest focus is on America throughout this. In other places, it happens as well. And where it doesn't, it's because of a cultural failing of some sort, the abdication of responsibility to the corrupt. World War Z isn't a horror novel, but it does address one important fear. The fear that we are complacent even when disaster is clearly coming. The fear that when it arrives, we won't be ready to face it, whether it's living dead or something as mundane as inadequate farm yields. World War Z walks us through it by witnessing events solely through the eyes of individuals, because individuals matter. Individuals can take a stand. When they don't, when they quietly go along with the rest of the crowd and refuse to think, well, I wonder what an apt comparison of that might be.
All hail the Overlord! All hail the Overlord!